So we talked a little bit about the theory of how it looks, you know, how the how we use the terms and what terms we need to use for testing and what different types of testing we can do. Let's look at the practice. So let's start with um, JUnit um, demo for Java. Uh, some of you actually do use Java either for the Android or for server side, perhaps. Um, so testing Java code with JUnit is is very easy, very straightforward, and uh, I strongly encourage you to, to use it. So let's fire up Android Studio, um, and we will create a new project. So we'll say, whoops, new project. Um, I call it, let's say, testing lecture. Okay, okay, blank activity. For those of you who never developed on Android, Android Studio is an ID for uh, developing applications for Android devices. Um, and Android Studio is supported by IntelliJ and Google. Um, and the, the default project, which I'm just generating, does nothing apart from showing a label on the white background which says hello world okay we will see it in, in a moment so this is what the the basic app does we will not be reading tips at that point right so if we run our app and i have a phone there to to actually uh, for those of you who want to check, it would basically run, you know, it would basically do this. It will start up a white background with hello world, okay? So what I will do here, I will specify an identifier for that label. Uh, so I will say Android um, ID equals um, Android ID equals at, and we call it our hello label. So I can refer to it in, in tests. Okay. So I, I now have a UI element which has an ID, and then if I do use tests, I can, you know, use. Uh, use that ID in my tests. So the automatically generated project already has a test suite generated for you. Uh, and there is a application test with a single constructor and nothing else. Um, so what you can do is you can, you know, right click here, say generate, and it has those four things. So test method is a method which will be our test case. It will be a method which becomes our test case. Setup method is a method which is run every single time before each of the test cases. So if you need to set something up, you can set it up using that setup method. So let's set up a, a global attribute of some sort. Yeah. It's a very contrived example. I just say I have one integer i, which is new integer, and its value its value is ten. Okay. Um, actually, I will do that inside the setup. Is it clear, visible enough? All right. So I have a field in my class and I set it up so I'm, I'm instantiating something. You can be instantiating a class which you are testing, you can instantiate some um, some activity that you need to you know check. Um, so you're instantiating something. Um, okay so then I go and I say generate a test method. This is JUnit 3. With, with JUnit 4, you have annotations, so you can annotate that setup and uh, test, 
test methods by the annotations. So you would say test, and here here you would say uh, setup. But because we we using uh, JUnit three, we have to follow a naming convention. So the setup method has to be called setup, and the test methods have to be called something with the first word being test. Okay, uh, and then in your test case, you actually do act you you code the actual behavior of what you're testing. So in our case, we want to make sure that the assert not null i that i is not null that it's been properly instantiated and assert equals that, you know, um, we expect value 10 out of int value of our i. Very trivial, very simple test case, right? So we have our setup function and we have our testing function. And now what we do is we have to edit the configuration, we have to add Android tests, we say test all, everything in our module, we say apply, okay, and now I have two targets, I can either run my app or I can test it all, and if I test it all, it will build everything. Um, It's sort of asking me to run on virtual device. I would like, I prefer to run it on the phone. So we'll fire it again. Oh, come on. Uh, I see. Okay, maybe what I did wrong, I said run the test in the emulator. I should say no. Ask me where I want the test to be run. Okay, so now if I do this, it asks me, oh, do you want to run this in the emulator or do you want to run it on the connected device? I will say run it on the connected device. It builds the app, rolls it to the phone, runs the app, and runs the tests against the app which is running on the phone, right? So it is instantiating the tests. And running them and then it says look you have three tests and all three tests passed right <laughs> so it tested three things um, I'm a little bit confused by that I had last night a bit of trouble with this uh, why you know suddenly I have three tests instead of just one <laughs> but let's let's not debug that in this session <laughs> <laughs> okay. so the, the main point is if one of the assertions fails I don't have a green bar here, I have a red bar here, and I have the test results which show me which of the tests failed, right? And I can keep adding test cases, so I can keep adding, um, yeah, let's try it. Let's generate one more test method. So we say this one was testing our integer, and this one is testing default failure. And if I say assert not null with null, it should fail, right? So if I rerun my tests, fingers crossed it will fail. Um, <coughs> it might have to do with the way the Android Studio is wired up. Um, but last night I have trouble. I did the same thing in the lecture and it worked. Yeah, it worked this time. So you see, I have a test, test default failure failing on me. And it tells me in which line exactly it's failing. It's failing in this line. And that's all I know, right? So if I had a kind of a complicated test, then I would have to sort of debug a little bit of why it is failing. But if I have very simple tests and they test one thing at a time, then it will tell me exactly what was passing and what was failing. Remember when you're debugging, you're kind of walking through your code. You say, okay, this line worked. Those things are not null, blah, 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 and you're doing step by step, right? You can repeat that in your test. So instead of you manually debugging, you can kind of verify <laughs> each 
logical sequence in your method of what worked and what didn't. And then instead of debugging, if something fails, you kind of immediately know what failed and you go into your code and, and start kind of testing it or checking, you know, fixing it. So th this is sort of a, a trivial example. If I said, okay, you know, um, you want the um, assert true and you want the integer in the value to be bigger than 10, okay? That will fail because our integer is, is 10. Um, so let's say, okay, it's like this. You can put uh, multiple assertions in a single test case and you will know which one fails because the tests tell you in which line they failed, right? So if I have, if you imagine I have multiple assertions in this test case uh, and one of them fails, the test will point me to that line which failed, but it will not run the following assertions. So it will stop. The first <laughs> failure happens, it stops. So we typically don't run very long sequence of, of assertions, but we logically group them. So if one of them fails, you know what failed, right? And you don't really need to look at the, at the rest. Um, but sometimes, yeah, sometimes you will have the rest of the test. So if I have, um, yeah, if I have my assert not null, um, let's say we have another integer j, right? So now that line will fail. That one would pass, but will not be run. So I will not know the result of this assertion until I fix the problem for that one. Yeah. So yeah, you can keep adding the test cases and just you know pressing that button and you have your app sort of slowly being tested. If you want to test the functionality which you don't have yet, so let's say I have, um, um, I generate another test method. So I will test my new class. Okay, so I want to test my new class, how, how, it, how it behave. I will have a, asynchronous task to load up the URL, okay? So I don't have it yet, I haven't written it yet. So I will kind of say, okay, what I would like it to be named. So async URL downloader. Uh, D equals new async URL downloader, okay? So, and then I would say D has an execute method as the async tasks have, and it actually takes the URL. So I will say, okay, there is a string URL and it will have some URL, HTTP. So what I'm doing now, I'm writing a test for thing which doesn't exist yet. I'm kind of doing test driven development, okay? So I would pass my URL here I would call execute and then I would expect, I would make some assertions. So I would assert not null d get data or something, right? So I have some API, I will have to write it because I have to write this test. So I have to imagine of what that API looks like, I have to imagine what my class name is and I have to use it. By doing that, it's better to design the class and to design the API than actually going and saying, okay, new class because I have already started using it and I have a feel of what is what I need and wh how it should work. So now I cannot run the test because I don't have those, class, th those classes yet. So I would kind of go to my code and I would say, okay, I actually need a new class. I need a new class and it's called async URL downloader and it's a class and it works like this. So now if I go back to my test, okay, I have it, but I don't have a method execute, right? I need to have a method execute. Okay, so um, I would say, okay, I need um, generate a constructor. We actually need a constructor because we need this um, URL. OK, 
okay and execute which does nothing and then I would need to have another one which is um, returning me the data which wouldn't compile if I return anything so I have to return something so I will return null right so now I have a test case for a new class which will run and it will fail because get data will return null and I said well actually I'm, I'm expecting to get something which is not null okay so now it will fail uh, which is okay um, and then I would go in here and I will make more assump assumptions of what how it will work so because I don't want the test to go off to the actual real server I would have to mock it I would have to mock of how the downloading of the thing will work right um, so this test fails so it fails here because I should not be null but it is and it fails here because I expect get data not to return null but it returns null make sense you you feel now that to test it to actually properly test it I would have to mock that process of downloading I don't really want because this the code here would actually properly download stuff right so I have uh, some object some uh, result object and I would return it um, okay it's null and here I would actually write a code which downloads it from some real service when I'm testing it I don't really want to the code to really go and download something I just want to make sure that this method does what it's supposed to do so I would actually mock um, the downloading part of that method I would not modify that method that method would really go and download something but <clears throat> if that method uses some HTTP service of some sort to download something I will mock it and will feed some dummy data in here to this method so then in here I can test that the data actually is what I expect it to be I will show you that example uh, using Jasmine so I will not mock it here but there is a Java toolkit for mocking things called Mokito and you can uh, mock some services or, or, or some things uh, and use it right any questions so far <coughs> so you know in, in 15 minutes we generated the test suite test cases we start writing some things and we have everything running and with one click of a button I have those tests always in my repo always there and I can test keep testing the same thing over and over again right if you debug something you spend say 15 minutes debugging it you fix the bug and this debugging time is lost you can't repeat it you can't reuse this time if you need to debug again you have to go and debug again right um, if you use testing the time spent on writing the test is there and it's the time which you can keep reusing as your pro, pro um, as your project grow um, so that's you know that's the huge advantage all right so let's let's do a quick demo which is similar to this but with a web development do, yeah yep you have Eclipse plugins for uh, for JUnit and Rune will show you if it works the continuous integration with Eclipse as well which actually runs the test as you press save uh, so there are tools in Eclipse same as with the Android Studio for doing that yeah all right so I will shut that um, and we will move to the Jasmine tests before I we dive into that I have to tell a little bit about uh, single page applications and kind of a modern architectures for web development so I have a very uh, quick three slides of how it historically was and how some of your apps may still work so in the past we have some publishing process which was pulling some stuff from the database preparing the content and then publishing it that model is still in use for example the the biggest Norwegian uh, news agency is doing similar thing because they can cache the static pages and serve them to customers much faster than generating them on the fly so they have an offline publishing process of pulling some stories and news items 
out of the real world, preparing static HTML snip snapshots, and then collecting them into this very complex new sort of portal where all those little bits and pieces are actually statically generated. They don't generate it on the fly. They use the old style model, model because they can combine it and serve really fast. Um, so some, some people still use that model. Um, and then the, the web server was sell, serving HTML pages, basically, right? OK. We moved a little bit. We moved to a model where we have some data in the database, and we have a server which can inquiry to the database. That's what most of PHP applications do. They have a template with some HTML code and some logic of how the dynamic content is being fed into the page. And then an HTML page is served to the client. Okay? So again, a lot of applications use that model, and that's one of the models which is still in use, but it's then new models for, for doing the same thing. So the new model is that instead of accessing the database directly, you may be pulling data from multiple databases or web resources. So instead of you doing, uh, sorry, instead of doing SQL statements like you're doing here, what you can be doing in your in your code is doing HTTP requests to Google services or Facebook services or your own services, and you might be getting data in a form of JSON or data which is not typical SQL results which you kind of had in the previous application, you have something more rich in here and you can you have more variety of how you're reading and writing that data, right? It's not just SQL. This bit does SQL. This web service will have to do SQL or no SQL like with, with Mongo, uh, but that bit only is interested in actually doing web service queries. It only uses JSON or XML or what, what you want, but it kind of sees the data logically as HTTP requests. Okay, so then there is a next step. Uh, and that, that one is good, again, widely used, but it's sort of, you, make, you mix um, the client and the server logic and the presentation and the model. And if you're not careful, that may become very complicated. And if you want to add some interactive JavaScript elements to this mixture, it gets really complicated, right? So for non-trivial things, this model is not ideal. This model has the same disadvantages of this model, although it makes the backend a little bit more structured and logical, but it still has disadvantages. Uh, of course, it has its strengths too. So sometimes that's the model you should use. The bottom line is that, again, you're serving HTML pages to the browser. Here, you're serving HTTP pages to the browser, right? But what this logic does can be pushed to the client, right? You can actually do the same from the client. You don't have to be doing it on the server side. So now you can separate uh, what the client pulls from the web services and what the web services do into kind of a client side and the server side. Uh, and the server side communicates with the client using JSON or uh, XML or some other you know, data structures. And then presentation logic is on the client and the server logic is on the server, right? So I will show you an app which, is, which follows that pattern, which has the presentation logic on the client and gets data to be presented from the client but doesn't have the backend at all yet, right? I only have that part. And some modern applications uh, follow that, and there is another kind of view of this. So you have a server code, which can be your PHP, could be your Java, Node.js, what, whatever technology you use. And you kind of write your server code separately to your client code. The client code will use HTML5 or HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And it will be responsible for some manipulation of the, of the content, but mostly for the presentation and logic on the client side, whereas this one will be responsible for the backend. So you clearly separated those two logical structures, right? And you can develop them separately. You can use different technologies for both and so on. So if you're using PHP for this, you don't need to use PHP templates for this. You can be using PHP and serving JSON only and don't use the templating of PHP engine at all. Use 
you know, Angular or use uh, JavaScript or whatever you like on the client side. You're not tied to be using PHP, right? You can break that, um, break that dependency. All right, so we will test this. We will build a small app using this model, the client side, and we will use Angular. Um, Angular is a, um, uh, there are some URLs which I've put in here. So um, Angular is a, a Google framework for doing kind of single page applications, which are having kind of data binding on the client side. And it's quite popular, very stable, very mature. Um, there are others, but we kind of use that for the purpose of the demo. And I included as the... With, as with all such frameworks, it's a little bit of a learning curve to get yeah. into that because there's lots of magic that's happening behind the scenes that you need to get used to. Exactly. So I included the slides to the to that presentation which I just showed you before, and I have the, the learning curve <laughs> here. <laughs> so, you know, that's how most people feel about Angular. They start doing something and they say, well, simple things are very simple, it's very nice, and then they have a fallback. Say like, what? Why things are like that hard? And why, you know? And then, oh yeah, you understand a little bit more and so on and so forth. But usually you have an up, upwards trend, right? You will have your setbacks, but most people say, you know, that's the framework is fantastic, okay? Do you agree? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> So that's very real. I mean, we <laughs> went through this and we had this up and down, up and down thing going. Absolutely. <laughs> I haven't reached the top yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So how we will do it. Um, I have a little application using um, Angular and using JavaScript uh, generated here. And I have the various technologies which are kind of use, used in here. So what I have, I have my editor window where I'm editing files and uh, you can use IDE, you can use uh, Eclipse or IntelliJ. I'm just using uh, Sublime for this, for this demo. It's a little bit simpler. So I will minimize that window so I can keep editing stuff. Um, and this is just a plain HTML file to start with. I have my console window where I just pulled the project. So I have the project files in here. And if I said git, git pull, it pulls it from the repo. The repo is also listed on the, um, in here. So that's the repo on Bitbucket, which I'm using. Um, and I'm using a build tool, which is called Grunt. So Grunt is responsible, responsible for building things for me, uh, generating the, um, proper HTML with all the includes and making all dependencies work and so on and so forth. So Grant is a tool which I'm using to do all the the manual things which you normally need to do to actually build it. Most of those things IDE will do for you. If using command line, you have to do it manually. So I will do Grant build to build it and it will go over all the tasks it, it requires to to build, uglify, generate the, you know, the, the final versions for the app. Um, and it will run the linter to make sure my JavaScript and my HTML are up to the standards. And it will run the tests. Um, I can do grunt test to run all the tests. And I believe the tests um, fail. So I have one test which tests main controller functionality, which is currently not Im implemented. So we're going to do that. But let's say, let's try if I can serve the current state of the, of the demo. Mm, maybe. Yes. So that's the browser window, which currently shows me what my app is doing. Okay, I will minimize it. So I, I normally work on a bigger screen <laughs> with two monitors. So I have those windows on different screens and I can fit everything in the single, you know, I, I see all those three things at the same time. Here we kind of, you have, we have to simulate that I have a bigger monitor. So I have to squeeze things. Now, 
now I have my development setup ready, right? So I go to my um, HTML page and I, for example, have the caption here which says demo. I can say um, testing demo and I press save and I have it refreshed. So I immediately see how it looks like in the browser if I'm developing, if I'm doing any changes here, right? I have what you see is what you get kind of type of, of environment, right? So if I keep modifying my code, if I keep modifying my HTML, I immediately see how, um, how the page looks like or how the app actually behaves, right? Um, so I may, um, yeah, I have, you know, that uh, footer here, I can say group, save it and it's modified and it says group now and so on, right? So I immediately see. Okay, so let's get to a bit of a logic. So my logic is hidden in two controller files which control those two pages. I have a home and I have about. About just says this is the about text and it has the header and the footer from the, from the um, uh, index HTML and home has this, this front page thing. And those front page things, uh, as you can see, I control in the index.html, I control the top bar, but the content and the footer, the footer is here and the top bar is here, but the, uh, but the main part, the actual body of it is in views. So I have the main view, which basically is responsible for that. So if I modify, uh, here it says AngularJS testing demo. If I just say testing demo, save that, it updates it and updates that part, right? So the Angular app is composed of the main app window and the views which I can manipulate at will and the views are partial HTML snippets. So as you can see, this partial starts with a diff it's just a diff element, and that's the diff which gets in here, right? Same for about, if I go to about and go to the about view, I just have one paragraph, which is this paragraph in squeezed in here, right? If I add something, if I have, uh, I say h1, um, hello from about, okay, save that, yeah, here it goes, right? So I have partial views, which in my app I can manipulate at will, and they go where the app supposed to place them. So that's about the presentation. How about the logic? Okay, so the logic is hidden into controllers, and I have a home controller which controls the logic of that page, and I have about controller which is responsible for the logic about that page. So let's have a look at the home controller. My main home controller currently does nothing. But it's supposed to do three, uh, two things. So, or three things. So if I go to my tests, so this is the logic of the, of the app, and I have test cases which are hidden here. And my test cases say that I have three test cases. Um, a little bit, a short word about the structure of the test cases. The test cases use Jasmine. Jasmine is, you know, a unit test slash acceptance test framework. It can be used for whatever you want. It sort of follows the um, the normal language to describe what it, it does. So you say what you're testing. So you're describing what you're testing and then you're saying it should or it does something. So you kind of follow like a normal English language a little bit but the logic is just a normal programming language, right? So you're describing your, your, your suit of what you're testing and you're describing your test cases of what they should be achieving and you're making your expectations and your assertions inside the body. It's very similar to JUnit tests. It just follows a little bit different naming convention. And it has the setup method, which is called before each here. Uh, and it does some, lo some magic. Um, we will talk a little bit about it in a minute, but let's first focus on that on, on that simple test case. 
So it says that my uh, main controller should have awesome things defined, right? And the awesome things should be bound to a scope. So if I go to my um, to my main controller, I can see I don't have it, right? I don't, I haven't defined um, anything in, in into my scope. I have kind of a copy and paste piece of code here, which I can do, and I can squeeze it in there. So now I'm de declaring something into my scope, which is called awesome things, and it has three elements. So if I save it, what's gonna happen here is it's gonna rerun, refresh that page, the view, and rerun the tests. And when it rerun the tests, um, actually it said it couldn't rerun the test because my linter complains that I'm using scope and it has not been defined. So I actually have to go here and say I'm using scope. Save it. Yeah, we will not go. We will not go into the logic of the Angular JS. It's like how the framework works. What I want to po point out here is that it says um, before, as you remember, like two tests were failing, right? Three three tests were failing. Now only one test is failing. So it says I have four tests. One failed, and the test which failed is this one. So it says. Main controller has get data method that makes HTTP get request failed. Okay, so if I go to my test, <coughs> I see that this test is passing. The next one is passing because it expects that the awesome things list has three elements, and as we see here, it does have three elements. So if I delete one, if the array only has two elements, um, now two tests will fail. Two tests failed. The awesome things should have three elements, but it expected uh, expected two to be three. So if I go to my test, I have that I'm expecting awesome things to be three, but actually awesome things returns two. So that test fails, right? So awesome things should be three elements long, and that's what this test is called. Um, Main controller also thinks should be three elements long, and that fails with this expectation of two to be three. Maybe yeah, maybe I should kind of write. Um, maybe I should write it like that. Up to you, which one is which, right? It will rerun it, and again it will fail, and it will tell me expect three to be two, <laughs> right? Doesn't matter. So one is what you expect, one is what actually is it is, right? So if I go again there and add one more thing, uh, new thing, then it will rerun the test, and I'm not running anything. Th those things happen as I'm typing, as I'm developing. So I have this window, I kind of code, and I keep seeing here what fails and what doesn't, right? I have one test failing. The test which is failing is that has get data should um, should make a, a web request. So I kind of pre-cooked a get data here. So I will go here and type my get data method. What get data does? It goes to this URL and it fetches data and then assigns the data which it got from the service to scope data, right? So same as we define scope awesome things, I'm, define, I'm getting a data from that particular URL and I'm assigning it to data in my scope. So now if I save it, my test will run again and again it doesn't sort of compile, the, you know, you actually don't compile JavaScript. It's the linter which complains that something is out of whack. And what's out of whack here is that I'm using a variable which is not defined, so I actually have to add it here. Okay, I save it. The linter runs fine, and the tests pass. The magic kind of worked, 
And if we go to our test again, uh, the test is like this. So I expect main controller to have get data method and the meta get data method makes HTTP request. So if we go to our body, we can see it does call HTTP request. But as we discussed before, I don't really want this method to make the real request. I want this method to make a mock request, I mean to, to make a real request to a mock service, get a mock data back, so then I can verify that this method does what it's supposed to be doing. So I'm doing that inside my main, uh, oopsie, inside my main test here. What I have, I have mocked, I injected a HTTP backend which intercepts all the HTTP requests and responds to some of them with certain answers. So I said, if you get a get data request, reply with this, okay? So then what I do here is I call get data. I know get data should call get data URL, which will get this back. So then I expect the answer to be my data because I set it to my data here, right? So I know what the service should do. It should request the data. I know what I'm feeding it back and I know what the service should do and what the result should be. And that's what that final expectation is. I know that the data answer should be my data because the, I'm responding with a JSON object which has the answer and my data here. Does it make sense? There is a lot of magic going on in here. There is a lot of things which we don't go really deeply into. But the idea is that I don't want the normal code to actually make a real request to Google or to Facebook or whatever. I want just to check if it does what it's supposed to do. And it should do two things. It should make a HTTP request, which I'm expecting here. So I'm saying backend should expect to get this request. If it doesn't, it will fail, right? So if I go to my main code and if I say the URL is something different, okay, and I rerun it, that test will fail because it expects this method to make a, so one test is failing and the test fails on that line, right? It, it, fails on, on this making this expectation fulfilled. This expectation is not fulfilled. If once that expectation is fulfilled, once the URL actually matches what I should be matching, then um, let's say we, my data, let's say the behavior of the method is wrong. So now I run the tests. Um, yeah, the linter complains I should be using single quotes. <laughs> okay. And it fails because data is not defined. What? Ah, it's defined but never used uh, because we have um, a, a variable here which I'm never using, so I have to delete that. Okay, so now the linter is happy, the code is nice, but the test fails. And the test fails because it expects the data to be what I actually passed um, back. And what I passed back was an object which had an answer and content, not just my data, right? And that's broken now. So I hope you kind of get the idea of what, uh, what we're doing here and how, how it works and why now all the tests pass. Uh, what's, what's nice about this setup is that as I'm developing, I can see what's, you know, how my code is ugly because the linter complains if I do things not the proper JavaScript way. And also it tells me which tests are, are still not working and I can see how it looks like and which buttons, you know, what the buttons do and how they behave all the time in the same kind of environment, right? So it, it is sort of a, a little bit of a demo of continuous integration tests where my tests are continually run every time I press save and I can kind of see the behavior of what my logic does and how you can sort of, you know, put all those things together to have kind of a, a development environment which is really ready for the agile development. Any questions?
we kind of encourage you to learn new technologies and new things, right? So Grant, uh, the J Shint for uh, doing the linter work, and Jasmine, uh, very nice tools to use. Angular is very nice as well, but it kind of works really well with single page applications where uh, most of the logic is happening on the client side and the server side only serves some uh, data that the logic is sort of mostly contained within the single page app. So if your case, if your app follows that sort of pattern, we encourage you to learn Angular and, and use this kind of tools and those environments. Um, yeah. Any questions? And maybe with 